Grace and peace and spoiler alert for the movie Dora and the Lost City of Gold. My name is Ryan and I'm the movie pastor. I watch movies and I interpret them theologically, paying attention to theological, moral, and ethical themes, as well as resources I have from the field of hermeneutics, from interpreting texts and preaching about them in order to enjoy films. And I watched a movie for preschoolers. Or is it? Kinda, sorta, not. Dora and the Lost City of Gold is an interesting film, pretty clearly inspired, well, obviously inspired by a children's cartoon, but also pretty clearly inspired by a college humor spoof of that cartoon, mashed together and made into a big jumbled pile of nonsense, which I didn't hate. Can you say delicioso? Say delicioso! She, she'll grow out of it. I mean, this movie is disjointed. There is a section of the movie that uh, follows Dora into a world of her own imagination, so the camera kind of takes on the perspective of the narrator and tells a story pretty similar to the cartoon. There's another part that really is a cartoon, and so we get an animated Dora. There's a part where Dora grows up and she's a teenager, and we have like a fitting into teenager life in LA story, and then we abandon that and go on a trip to the jungle. And it just keeps kind of shifting between all of these the whole time. Say goodbye to your little friend. What is happening? Swiper! Adios, losers! Abukuna Pinyaska Kashanku. Everyone get out of here! Uh, what about the gold? It doesn't matter! Wait. Uh, now, if I do the work of interpretation and ask, what's the movie about? What's it trying to say? Uh, I'm probably, in my reaching, going to take something like uh, an idea that was introduced early in the movie, uh, which is connected to the title. That's a good hint that you're at something that the movie is trying to be about, where her dad says that explorers don't look for gold, but they seek to uncover new things, and the discovery of unknown knowledge is the real treasure, at which point Ava Longoria says, treasure hunting bad, exploring good. So that, that could be the moral. That, that could be what this movie is about. And, and in some ways that's backed up for the rest of the movie and in some ways it's undermined. For instance, uh, that is returned to explicitly in the Bollywood dance number that takes place at the end of the film. And at that point they say, we came together, that's the real treasure. We came together, that's the real treasure. So they're, they're, they're speaking to something being the real treasure, right? There's parallelism there. There's a repetition of that phrase, but now it's making friends and coming together. The new thing we're discovering, and they play with this theme in the movie, is new friends. There's a lot to explore in high school in Los Angeles, not just in the jungle with ancient ruins. So we agree and yet we disagree. The pieces match, but not quite. Why? What, why was this decision made? Well, it seems that if the filmmakers were committed to anything in terms of their means of expression, in terms of how they went about this movie, it was to make a movie that was intentionally and effectively, profoundly ADD. I mean, it, it's just an ADD movie. It, it never gets boring because it never keeps doing the same thing for long enough for you to really catch up with it. And it's that way for a reason, because it's probably not a movie that was designed to be watched attentively from beginning to end. 
It's certainly not a movie that was designed to be analyzed by someone with a master's degree uh, trying to find deeper meaning in it. This is a movie that could be played in a playroom and you could watch some of it, get bored, play with some of your toys, go back, watch some more, stop paying attention, and, and still be able to generally enjoy the movie. The, the meaning then is that Dora is peppy, optimistic people are good, making friends is nice, being mean is bad, and as long as you're kind of jibing with those points, the actual like elements of story and why are they in the jungle now, eh, it doesn't matter. Well, that connects with actually a really important idea in biblical hermeneutics um, that there's a big college word for, and that's the idea of a pericope. Can you say severe neurotoxicity? A pericope. So whenever we engage a text, which includes uh, something written down as well as uh, a movie, a piece of artwork, whatever it is that you're going to kind of read or analyze or engage, uh, we have to ask the question, what portion of the text is meant to be consumed in one sitting? And that's, that's called a pericope. What, what am I meant to have fresh in my mind as I engage this next part? So a pericope, it, the, the closest word we have it in, in normal like English parlance would be a, a story, right? But part of the same story, part of one story. And I would argue that in Dora, we actually, mo most movies are one pericope, right? Most movies, they expect you to go to the theater, watch the whole movie, pay attention to the whole movie, and then leave. And that's one pericope. Dora, I would argue, is numerous pericopes, and every, every scene or every section or every vignette in a different storytelling style, it stands on its own and goes together as part of a larger work, but you could consume that larger work over any period of time you would like to. I think that's kind of cool. Um, and, and we're seeing people play with pericopes more in Hollywood, for instance, it used to be that every episode of a TV show was its own pericope, right? You had episodic Star Trek, where uh, Kirk and Spock would go off, they'd discover a new planet, they'd have an adventure on that planet, and by the end of the episode, the adventure would be over, they'd be back in space exploring Brave New World, so that each episode could be watched pretty well in any order. They all begin and end the same with different stuff in the middle. Now, increasingly, uh, we're getting bingeable TV shows so that a single season of a show is more of a pericope than an episode is. And to really make sense of a given episode, you certainly have to see all the episodes before it, and you probably should have seen those episodes relatively recently, ideally right before, if it's meant to be binged. Um, so, so that's a brilliant question, I think, with interpreting any text, and it is deeply, deeply important when we come to interpret the biblical text. Because this, I, I, I mean, this is a lot of pages. This, the Bible is a little bit shorter than the entire Harry Potter series. So it's probably not meant to be consumed in one sitting. Who here can hold their breath for seven minutes? It's hard to tell with all of this water, but I'm assuming none of your hands are raised. So I really want to thank Dora and the Lost City of Gold for illustrating that concept so beautifully because it's a, it's a really hard concept to grasp and it's a really important concept that comes up in the field of biblical hermeneutics often because it changes the way we read certain parts of the Bible if we assume that they're meant to be read in context with other parts, right? For instance, um, Abraham not sacrificing Isaac, Abraham binding Isaac in Genesis. Many of us read that with the epistle to the Romans in mind. Well, the epistle to the Romans was written long after the Akedah, the binding of Isaac. So when we put those two in conversation, we end up with different conclusions than if we were to read them separately. And we have to ask the question, what stories are meant to be read together and what stories are meant to be read separately? What is part of the same pericope? 
And pericopes can be long or short. I would argue, for instance, the whole book of Revelation is meant to be read together. There are numerous verses in Revelation that talk about anyone who hears this book, which implies that the expectation uh, for someone receiving the book is to sit in a room while somebody reads it aloud to you, presumably all together in one sitting. Meanwhile, there are numerous gospel stories that I think um, can really be chunked up quite small. The, the book of Psalms is one of the easiest books to divide into pericopes, and it contains both the longest and the shortest chapter of the Bible. I mean, I don't think anyone would argue that you're meant to read only part of a psalm or you're meant to read more than one psalm together to get full context. And yet those, those individual songs, those, those psalms vary enormously in length. So next time you open a book, especially if it's the Bible, I hope you remember Dora and ask the question, hey, how much of this am I meant to be reading together for context? And, and at what point have I moved into a different idea, a different mode of storytelling, a different genre of literature? I hope that blesses your reading, and I'll see you next time. Bye. And when in scenes of glory I sing the new, new song, t'will be.